Hello, I am Mayor Libby Fay of the town of Buena Vista. Welcome to our Board of Trustees meeting. Um, the time is 707 and um, the date is uh, April 13th. I mean, April 11th of 2033. Um, if you haven't done so already, please silence your cell phones. And um, Lillian is with us tonight, Lillian Simpson. Paul is on vacation. And Lillian, would you please uh, do a roll call? Trustee Cobb. Here. Trustee Hilton Higa. Here. Trustee Jenkins. He's supposed to be on Zoom. Jenkins, Trustee Jenkins, are you here? Can you hear I'm us? Here. Sorry there. about that. Um, Trustee Lucrezzi. Here. Trustee Riddle. Here. Trustee Swisher. Here. And I'm here. Um, <laughs> so now I have the, uh, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Tonight I have a special privilege, which is to um, issue a proclamation um, Jan, would you come up here, please, and, and uh, your friends as well, if you'd like. Mm. Yeah, sure. Yeah, here. Here's a good cake. <laughs> uh, Jan has been the owner of um, Jan's Restaurant for many years. 32 years. 32 years. That's amazing. Right. Okay. Doing it 45 years. Oh, man. Wow, good for you. That's so cool. You're a definite institution here in the town of Buena Vista. Well, I've employed many young people who are adults now oh, over the years. So that's great. Yeah. yeah. And I have enjoyed this town immensely. It's a special place. It is a special place. I really appreciate your part in it. Um, so, uh, uh, Jan has now sold the business. Yes. And we don't know. It is supposed what. to remain the same. Okay. One of my employees that's been there 20 years is going to run it for the new owners. Okay. And everything is supposed to remain the same. Same hours, same food, same employees. Some people would be terribly disappointed if they know I keep getting your I've chicken, had chicken fried chicken and mashed potatoes. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> and your breakfast is legendary. Well, I sure love being in this town and serving the people. And I came from, I started out in Green Mountain Falls, oh, yeah. went to Lake George, huh. Woodland Park. And now I've been here for 32 years. It's wonderful. Right. Um, Jan's has become known as a place for frequent visitors to stop while visiting Buena Vista. Um, also, lots of organizations meet there. Yes. I know I've been there early in the morning with the right. optimist. optimist yeah. <laughs> um, and we, we, as the board, would like to recognize Jan's restaurant for the many years of providing not only a meal and service, but a place of true community space. Thank you. Now, therefore, I, Mayor Libby Fay, and the Board of Trustees hereby proclaim that the town of Buena Vista gives special recognition and tribute to Jan Del and Jan's restaurant for the many years of outstanding service on behalf of the town of Buena Vista. And I will sign this proclamation which is given under my hand and the seal of the town of Buena Vista on this 11th day of April, 2023. And we have a, we have a, a little a plaque here with the, um, with the proclamation and the town seal and my signature. Thank you. Thank you, you're wonderful. Oh, thank Thanks you. Thanks for all you've done. Well, I love this town and I love the people in it. 
That's great. There's going to be many tears on May 1st. Oh, for <laughs> sure. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate this. Oh, no, thank you very much. Now we're to the matter of the agenda adoption. <laughs> um, I think Sue Cobb has a proposed change in the order of the agenda. I do, uh, possibly, but, um, oh, yes. Um, I was, I was just, if I may ask Betsy a quick question. Do you, are you also going to slide it tonight? No, okay. they're next week. Okay, yes. okay. So Great. it may not be necessary. I just thought if you were trying to get to both meetings, you might try to change the order, but okay. I would have to stay. I appreciate sure. that. So does, does anyone have any um, proposals or changes to the agenda? Um, if not, I would, uh, Appreciate a motion to approve the agenda as written. I'll make that motion. Thank you. Is second. there a second? So we have Swisher Hilton Hinga. And then we have the consent agenda. And the consent agenda has uh, minutes of um, the Water Advisory Board and the Trail Advisory Board and our minutes from um, the end of March. Um, there's a police chief report in there. Um, also, you may take note of item C, which is a, a pub, approving a public improvement agreement with Mountain Dream Enterprises, LLC. Um, if anyone ever has questions and you want to pull something away from the consent agenda and have it as a business item, that is an acceptable uh, request on, on your part. Sarah, I have a question, if that's okay. Okay. Thank you, Gina. What is your question? Sure. Um, in the consent agenda, I'm just reading the, the, um, the Water Advisory Board minutes. If Sean's there, just for clarifying, just to make sure I understand this correctly, under... The business section, public comment, um, or sorry, business section, um, I think it's number two. Um, it's, it mentioned Sean presented a comprehensive report of annual water production of, you know, blah, blah, blah. Big number and an average in, un, unaccountable water of 13% Ivy League uh, subdivision showing that 48% uh, loss. So I guess what I was, when I read that, so it shows that we have a total of 13% unaccounted for, but it's almost half of that coming from the Ivy League subdivision. Is that correct? Is that what that? Um, yeah. So for clarification, I think the, it was the same report that I presented to, to this board back in, I think, January. And, and I think for the annual uh, unaccounted for the, you know, from the, the, the master meter of the water plant to the build usage for the year, it was 13%. And the average um, unaccounted for the year for Ivy League was that higher number. What was that, 48%? Is that what, 48. Is that what it is? 48. 40, 48%. Yeah, so those those two are kind of tied together within the, uh, the Ivy League um, subdivision. Okay. So, so, so the forty eight percent is just specific to the users at, at Ivy League. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure I was understanding it correctly and that I understood yeah, everything. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Any other questions about the consent agenda? Uh, yeah, I just had a quick question for the um about the uh public improvement agreement. Since it's a minor subdivision, most usually that doesn't come to the board, right? Is that just because it's public improvement or? Yeah, so um, the public improvement agreements have been in the consent agenda um, on our agendas in the past, but I'm looking to put them in a business item here forward, just so you guys can hear a little background on them. So, um, but the attorneys have advised on that, I believe. Um, Jeff, I don't know if you're there, if you want to weigh in on that. 
Yeah, I'm here. And so, uh, yeah, typically it just, it can be on your consent, but if there's anything um, unusual or detailed, it can go onto a regular agenda item for discussion. Um, most of these are pretty straightforward. It's the same form agreement we usually use for everything. So um, it, it's really up to the board if they want to actually have discussion, it can go off a consent idea agenda or it can stay on the consent because they're pretty standard. Yeah, um, I, I just have one other uh, question on that. And this may be something I just didn't see in the in the packet or it's not it's not time for it to be discussed, but where are we, is, is part of, have we already allocated the water or set aside the water for this um, subdivision? I don't, does that happen? No, I don't think so, not yet. Okay. Yeah, so, and this one was pretty basic. It had to do with some landscaping and other things that we, you wouldn't know so by the amount of <laughs> the volume of paper that was in the packet. <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, we just kind of make that call by the discretion of, you know, when we look at the agenda and the PIA agreements and kind of go with the, the lawyers, the attorneys recommendation on, hey, you know, we might want to put this one on as a business item. And I'm kind of getting more and more familiar which ones you'll want to see. So obviously, when we get to the street, some of those other ones will be putting them in a business item so that we can talk about. If you're okay with that. Great. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? I so move. Second. Thank you. We have Cobb and Swisher. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. I'd like to uh, step back to the uh, agenda adoption for a moment. Um, we didn't have a vote on that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Aye. That motion passes as well. Um, when you entered the room, there's a there's a clipboard to sign in for public comment. Each person, no no one has signed up. Um, Lisa, is there anyone on Zoom who has asked to speak? Let's take a look at participants here. If anyone does want to speak at public comment in general, you sign in on the put forward and then you can have three minutes to speak on any topic that is not going to be addressed in a public hearing. Mayor, I don't see any hands raised, so it looks like we're good. Okay, great. So we'll move to staff reports. We begin with you, Lisa. Awesome. Well, um, I wanted to just step through some highlights in my report real quick. Um, you'll notice that the list of meetings has grown. That was somewhat intentional. I wanted you to have greater visibility into internal staff meetings that I have. So I've just started to include those, at least for a little while, so you have some ideas of, you know, that's about half my time, I think. And so I wanted you to see those as they're occurring. So I'll continue to do that uh, for your visibility. Um, we had a visit from Heather Evans with the UAA COG. And that was really great. She came to our uh, team lead meeting and gave us an overview of all the services that they provide. And I was actually really astounded with all the different things that they provide, everything from aging to economic development. I knew about their housing programs, but they have one also for if you needed uh, repairs and you're certain to your, to your home, so you have uh, dilapidated conditions with your house, we have programs for that if you're a certain income level. So I'm gonna just pass this around. We have this also posted outside of the community center um, and we have also given it to the chamber. And I think that Heather will be hopefully coming to a chamber coffee um, at some point or sending someone from her office to talk about these programs. But one thing that struck us uh, was that, you know, with our code enforcement officer, when he encounters some of the some of these conditions, he can you know use these services as like a referral service, um, and so just it was nice for all of the team leads I think to hear about the different programs so that we can be sure and refer everyone to those programs. 
Um, the other thing is she came to visit and look at our mini grant projects. So we took her to Charles Street and Highway uh, 24 and showed her uh, where that project would be and took a couple of pictures for the reporting. Um, and then we also brought her here to the community center. And that was a really timely mini grant because our <laughs> furnace ended up going put like a week after they told us that they were going to be helping us. Um, partially uh, contribute to that to that project. So that was really great. Um, the rodeo grounds, I was just want to briefly touch on that. Um, we actually went out on site um, last Friday um, with Jim McGrady and a couple of other people from Tribeview. I think that was very productive. It's just really, really neat to walk the site and see what we have out there and the potential that we have. Um, we talked about the first um, item of action that we would get into with the site development would probably be the trails. Um, so there's a 5k trail that's proposed in the master plan. And I think that's uh, what we're leaning towards. We talked about the type of material that would go into that trail. Um, and so, and then we also identified some areas for a culvert that would be necessary. So it was just really productive. And I think it went really well. Um, and I guess that's probably mostly the ones that I want to highlight. I did attach um, also for you the uh, um, Orion Integrated Services IT reports to get a feel for what's going on there. And then a big one was uh, C. Daniel report had some kind of status in red font of all of our projects and where we're at with that. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Are there any questions from the trustees on Zoom? Yeah, Mayor, uh, this is Trustee Jenkins. Hello. Um, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I just wonder if Lisa could go back to her schedule at the beginning of her presentation. I had a question about something. Sure. Yeah, um, your um, town administrator open employee time. Can you explain what, what that's all about, Lisa, please? Yeah, so I just um, started doing that we, every um, the week prior to our meetings on Tuesday. So it would have been last Tuesday and then the coming Tuesday, we have our team lead meetings and that's just for department heads. But one of the things that I wanted to do was create an open time for any employee to approach me um, and at, at an area that would be a little more private. So this is a meeting that's open to any employee. I'll be there for an hour before that meeting to where if, if an employee needs to talk to me about a topic and they want a little bit of confidentiality, that there's that ability or even team leads. So it's for all employees. It's just an open hour. Um, so I'll do that twice a month so that if there's anything that they need to talk to me about, they have a time they can do that. And that's great. That's a great idea. Yeah, that's a great idea. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And others tag up me meeting with me. Um, so it's just another term that I use for uh, meeting with a department head. Sometimes I call it a tag up. Okay. Just a fancy, fancy term. <laughs> so. Other questions for Lisa? Uh, question comment. Right. Um, it was very interesting to see your key dates. Um, does, and it's great that you're that organized and like, but you don't have a lot of open times filling your slots. So are you available if someone has a critical question or do they have to wait for a team meeting or something else to be able to speak to you? No, I think that they know, and that was part of my discussion at the team lead meeting was they can, of course, approach me. I, I, I think it's good for, if they can, to do that through their department head, because that's what their department exactly. head is for. But, um, you know, I wanted there to be a direct route to me if they needed to um, for any sort of, and who knows what that would be. Really, I'm not doing it for any reason other than I want them to have a direct route to me if they need to, but I believe in all of our department heads are very competent supervisors. And so they're the first line that they would go to and they can schedule a time with me. 
So that was communicated as well. And like I said, you have a relatively full schedule yes. um, and being open to a citizen coming in and wanting to speak to you. Um, I, I'm a little concerned about how full your schedule is if you need assistance or it becomes too overwhelming or you're feeling stress. Um, I want you to feel free to come to us because employees are our greatest asset and I don't want you overwhelmed by having such a full schedule. I appreciate that. Thank okay. you very much. Okay. And I will communicate that with you if, if it gets to that point. You do have a lot on my plate. I know you do. You've got a lot <laughs> so to learn. So I appreciate that. I, I mean, yeah. not being critical that you've got a lot to learn. No. That didn't come out right. But being new in your position, yes, you're learning a lot. Yeah. And I just don't want you to get to where sure. things are overwhelming. I appreciate that. Thank you. Other trustee, just one question. This is probably just me on Fantasy Island, but is there any chance that the um, park and ride could also be a Mustang stop um, if we need it? Uh, I so I, looking for you know, and I don't have a lot of deep details on that because it's kind of one that's been lingering for a while, <clears throat> but I think that the intent may be, because right now they come right outside of town hall in that area, I would assume that would be an area for them to go more officially once it's completed. And so it's it's an exciting topic. Um, and there's a lot going out, uh, going on in that area in general. And you'll probably see some things, um, you know, in the near future regarding meetings to talk about concepts out there. Um, just so we can get Phil and kind of tie everything in. I know that was one thing that Keith Baker had mentioned at the annual CDOT meeting was meeting it maybe out at the airport and talking about some of these projects because a lot of them are out in that area. So thanks. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Any more Zoom comments or questions? Okay, let's um, move along then. Thank you. Um, <coughs> is Robert Bertram on the? No, no. the fire chief uh, unfortunately did have um, something come up and he's unable to make his verbal report tonight, but um, he did, I believe, provide the written report right. for you. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to interface those questions for you for you, or you obviously have his email as well, but um, I could have him come back to the next meeting too, if you prefer. I read the report and I didn't have any questions. Yeah, so I know. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, public works director, Sean Williams. Hey everyone. <laughs> well, I thought my report looked pretty good and so I looked at it tonight and I was like, <laughs> uh, why did I bother? Um, you know, I always have I always have like a big appetite when when I when I get to this and there's a lot I want to cover, but it seems like when it comes time to do my report, um, I seem to have a bandwidth issue from time to time. Plus, this is like the thing that I'm like completely uh, like I wouldn't say struggle with, but like getting my thoughts out and, and, and putting a report together is uh, I'm, I'm good at it, but it's not my strengths. Anyways, um, I'll get to it. And I'll try to cover a lot of the, the, the stuff that I just kind of made notes of, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that and try to give everybody um, an opportunity to ask questions too, if you have any. So um, as usual, the water report, we do have a leak right now. Joe identified it uh, earlier this week. So we have a, a little dig up coming our way here in the near future. Um, but I uh, just kind of wanted to kind of, you know, kind of convey the, the amount of water that was on camp this month. It was mostly due to the fact that we, uh, we filled the Ivy League tank, the, the one on T Road recently. And so that's about a 270,000 gallon tank. And we basically super chlorinate the water, let it cook for a while, get the back teas up. It's all part of the CDPHE uh, compliance for, for disinfection processes. And so in, in reality, what winds up happening is we kind of wind up, we wind up like turning that water over and then we wind up having to, to waste a lot of it. So that had a lot to do with it. It was about 700,000 gallons, I believe Joe said, about what we dumped out of the tank. Um, but anyways, that's kind of that. Um, the water plant project updates, um, you know, 
we, we we're moving pretty quickly on, on a lot of things. So by the time I kind of get some of this data or information in here, we we, we seem to have kind of like made, made some progress. So um, late last week and early this week, we wrapped up the pump test for the infiltration galleries. And the infiltration galleries were the were was was the phase that the DWIN company came in and put in the, the galleries. And so it looks pretty good. It's pretty preliminary. For sure. I mean, we're it gives us enough information to start sizing the pumps and and how we'll uh, transfer some of that water into the, uh, the the new filtration units that we have there. But it looks pretty good. It looks like one leg is probably going to be capable of doing about six hundred gallons a minute, and the other ones probably conservatively it's it's probably in three to four hundred gallon per minute range. And so. That, you know, that's pretty cool. It kind of triples our winter water production. So right now in the wintertime, we're about able to do 400. And so when it's all said and done, if we, if we, if we hang on to that, you know, it's probably going to be like 11 to 1300 gallons per minute, which is kind of that number that we're targeting with our development. The, so that SFE tracker, not quite our full water, right? That's more closer to about 1700 gallons a minute, but we have a lot of work to do. We have some other things that we're doing out there, but it, so it's more than likely to improve. And so, Phew. Um, hey, we have water in there, so I, I, I was just going to resign if we didn't uh, have water in there. <laughs> no. um, anyways, um, so that that's going that's going pretty good. We have some uh, meetings tomorrow to kind of talk about the information that we gathered over the, the last few days. Um, yeah, I kind of feel like I'm not probably sharing enough information at this time with the Elk Run uh, Water Supply Protection District application. I can say that we're compiling. So, so an application was submitted and you've seen it on my report for the last few times for a roads application. And that one's pretty clean and that one meets our ordinance and meets our code, but we have a few things that we need to kind of resolve with that and understand a little bit better um, before that application is finally approved. The second application is, is definitely more high level. That has to do with the hydraulic report, some of the wells that are gonna be installed, some of the on-site wastewater treatment systems that are in the water supply protection district, you know, um, how they're being designed, where they're being located. Um, and the water advisory board and um, staff, and um, right now pretty much um, Al's wrapped up a, wrapped up a, a report for me to look at and he's analyzed the, the treatment methods and um, we're probably going to lean on Rachel Pittenger a little bit on the hydraulic report because that's what Rack Water is really good at. So the cool thing is, is they have a really good civil engineer to help us with the roads, have a really good, um, uh, you know, high level engineer with water, a licenses, chemical engineer to kind of evaluate the uh, treatment systems <clears throat> and, uh, and a really talented uh, engineering team that knows all about hydraulics. So that's kind of where we're at with that. And then um, oh my gosh, the water advisory board's really, really talented right now, and, and they're engaged and they're invested. So we've provided some a lot of the information and some spreadsheets to allow for them to provide us some feedback and questions. Um, the Elk Run team did come to the water advisory board meeting, I think it was last week or the week before. It was just, yeah, and anyways, and kind of presented the project to them. So it was a really good kind of Q&A session and able to kind of talk through a few things and... Um, yeah, it was it was fantastic. I I, I, I um, I'm, I'm really happy that we were able to get get to that. It's kind of helped kind of um, kind of cut to the chase, you know. So face to face time, be able to answer some questions, be able to understand some things, and let the development team kind of understand the things that we're really concerned about and the things that we'll be looking at, you know, closely through the through the application process. Um, but I guess you know probably in the next board meeting, if you'd like to see a lot more, maybe. You can, I can probably share with you the location, some of the site plans and some of the maps and maybe some of the questions that the teams kind of you know, uh, brought up and then some of the answers that come to that. So, you know, it is our water supply protection. And so um, it's going to be important. So I will make sure I get that in. Um, upper tank painting project, the RP is ready to go. There is uh, a bit amendment in there. It's, uh, a lot for additional work to be done. If somebody wanted to play, paint a mural on there, we can spec what kind of paint that would be. I don't have a mural design in mind. Um, and kind of like right now, I'm just kind of trying to figure out when the best time it is going to be to put that RP up. Um, yeah, we're, we're kind of busy right now. So we have a few things that we're trying to get done. But I think more than likely, um, you know, if we can get it, 
out in the work being done. It's probably going to be a fall project at this time, but the RP is ready to go. I'm just kind of trying to understand some of the scheduling that we have between all the departments and all the things that we're doing and the development that's happening here right now and things like that. So just making sure we can realistically do it. Um, I'm really good at trying to uh, do things that I don't have time to do, which winds up kind of hurting, hurting my team a little bit. Um, yeah, um, had a stormwater plan, uh, master plan kickoff meeting with with Rick's team, Gary Welps, fantastic. Gary does a lot of development review for public works and planning. These, um, you know, uh, Hess Halverson minor subdivisions and some of the, the crossing, um, the boulders, um, the farm, um, the homestead stuff. That's a lot of what, what Gary does for us. So um, this is right up his alley. He provided the two drainage reports for the east and the west side of town back in 2014. So he has a real intimate perspective on what we need. And he has a really interesting perspective on where the development is. So I think that the drainage plan, stormwater plan, um, will be a lot like the water resource master plan, kind of identifying our our, uh, our weaknesses and kind of identifying you know our, our the areas that we need to improve, the areas that we need to be watching out for. Um, I promised you all a uh, development handbook review like two months ago. Um, yeah, the best I got was like some uh, sniffing tool JPEG pictures of the table con contents and, and a few details in here. I, you know, I just haven't been able to pull that up, uh, prioritize that for, um, you know, through the course of my week. But I wanted to give you that just so that you can see like the table of contents and some of the things that we're doing and some of the upgraded details. So if you ever go into chapter, uh, chapter 13, um, you, you see some details that look like they're probably from like the 40s or the 30s. And so this is really clean, good line weight, really clean, branding logos on there. Um, they've done a fantastic job. And then you know, the table of contents for the section is very thorough. Um, but wanted to kind of share with you that. I think at some point we'll be working with that and you will have a little bit more to do with that when it comes time to adopt it and kind of cross-reference that with some of our code. Sorry, I'm taking so long. I've got a lot here. Um, um, I'm going to kind of jump into a little bit with the parks. I don't know if you have any questions with the streets, but you know, kind of a little um, kind of tool right there on the on on the parks, just kind of show what we're doing. And and these are all obviously kind of much larger projects for that team, not necessarily the operations, but kind of where we're at. You know, right now. Um, we're probably going to be wrapping up the cemetery block marker installations, you know, in the next week or two. While we're doing that, you know, we're handling, you know, the operations. So trash, bathrooms, things like that, it's going on. But we have, a, a, I don't know, wreck has gone rogue. Um, I'm joking. There's no wreck. <laughs> yeah, the McFellamy stage, fantastic. They're in there doing the work. Um, we're kind of coming, the, the parks team kind of comes in after the fact and it kind of cleans it up after, you know, maybe the irrigation system gets broken or some, or earth needs to be moved around and they're doing really, really good with that. Uh, but that's going to take a little while. I think, I think collectively we probably hit our irrigation system every time we try to dig in there. So probably seven to 10 times. So that, it's not too horrible, but, um, they're doing a great job and, and so is Rack and so, so is the team that's working on the stage. In that project. So um, likely going to jump into the uh, Charles Street landscape project. And that's part of this UAA COG stuff that we got the mini grant for. So probably in May sometime, but we'll kind of want to wipe out a couple of these things, make sure the irrigation system's up because a few more days like today, we'll probably be wanting to turn our sprinklers on in our parks and things like that. So um, it takes a little bit of time to do that. And uh, we have some action items left over from last year, the beautification advisory boards, pocket park, plant the tree over there. We removed the trees in that location last, last fall. So now we're ready to go. Arbor Day project and the street, you know, street planting projects and town of BB cleanup days. And I'm, I'm just, I'm gonna call summer starts June 1st. I'm not gonna pretend that it starts in April or May, but uh, you know, in between that, we still have a lot of filler things like getting the flower pots on Main Street, getting the banners up for graduation and a lot of cool little small projects that kind of fall into that too. Um, we received one bid for the Arizona Bridge Project. Um, so uh, it's a little more than what we have right now. So, but uh, we got a little bit of direction. We, we, we kind of crewed up email conversations with CDOT and that agency's kind of given us some advice. 
Um, it's about twice as much as we, what we budgeted for. So I'm not asking for a budget adjustment tonight. I'm joking, but um, but a, the, the cool thing is is that the 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 uh, the bidder really wants the job. And so on Friday, uh, Ben Groney, he's with Olson. He was the engineer that helped us get the project out, get back to see that work on the plan sets, get it out for bid, and he's kind of facilitating the space of the project. So. Um, he met with the, the bidder and we're looking at areas that we could possibly be creative and cut without, without um, you know, removing what the narrative was for the grant, right? So basically, you know, a kind of a safe route to school kind of a thing, the bridge project. Um, and um, I think the big things that kind of came in there was it's a, it's a pretty extensive project when it comes to shoring, you know, there's a water main in there, there's some bridge abutments, it's a really tight area. So I think there's a chance that you know, we might be able to save quite a bit of money. We'll find out here, you know, how much we could spend, but we were trying to do that project without closing the road. If we did close the road, there's a chance we might, we might be able to save, you know, somewhere, you know, between 700 and 800,000 mm. dollars. And so just depending on what time of work we're gonna be doing that, um, you know, we can't do any of that work during runoff, which, you know, generally lasts until early July. So that's kind of shot. So maybe a fall kind of project and maybe possibly the closure. But, you know, we probably want to talk to the school district before we did something like that. And we definitely want to talk to our community a little bit before we do that, but I'm optimistic and we'll see how it goes. Um, but yeah, we, we do have to kind of um, kind of look at, you know, the OPCs and what the project costs. And there's, um, you know, we trust our engineering cost estimates. So it's just a little higher than what we had hoped. Yes, ma'am. How long of a closure are you considering? It's not a permanent closure, right? No, it, or is it? You know, uh, I asked him that too, and I think it's kind of hard to say, um, but you know, um, my guess is that closure could be a month, maybe, maybe, maybe three weeks, mm -hmm. maybe two months. And not permanent. Not permanent. And that would just be at the intersection from Marquette um, north. And so the Marquette intersection could stay open, um, but probably between you know, the Marquette Avenue, Arizona Street intersection, um, and just kind of somewhere you know, between the turnoff to uh, um, River Run and, and there. So just a small section with some detours. So, um, well, we'll keep our fingers crossed on that. Anyways, um, if you have any questions, I'll wrap it up there. You have a huge job. <laughs> I yeah, I'll say one thing. Like uh, I always give credit to like our team. Um, I, uh, I I appreciate Lisa. Lisa's um, <clears throat> Lisa's been has a, had a lot to absorb, and, and she's been really helpful to me. Um, she's been supportive to how how busy we are and. Uh, and I, and I know that she's got her hands full. Um, there's a lot going on here, maybe maybe a little too much going on, but, but here we are. Um, but I think Lisa's done really good, uh, you know, public works uh, projects that we have. She's, she's done a really good job kind of helping us get all the way back to the Dola Grant application the stuff that we're doing. You know, she's um, putting a lot of faith in our team here and, um, and she's been supportive. So uh, anyways, uh, Appreciate that too, uh, and obviously Philip Joseph, all of it's it's a pretty good team. So I'm pretty lucky lucky to have. We do have a good uh, team. We're on it, so. But maybe you can help us uh, direct the efforts of the of Public Works so that <clears throat> he's not working hard to provide us with something that we don't feel like we've asked for. So. so I think, yeah, there's just a lot of projects and, and this project that we're talking about, of course, it's been over the course of what, 12 years? Like 12 years. years. 12 yeah. years. <laughs> and there's a grant that's connected to that and there's at some point an expiration of that grant. We've been very lucky to, you know, have the help with the consultant too to help us negotiate that and work on maintaining this. If you could just stop development, it'd be fine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, thanks for that. Something. There we go. I think there's a lot of effort into he does a great job, so appreciate him too. So, okay. Okay. I have a comment on the cemetery markers. Mm -hmm. 
Good job. The, the ones that we looked at, you definitely picked the nicest looking ones and they, they do look nice out there. Yeah. Yeah. And we do need, we do need location markers out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Really nice. Thanks. Thank you, Sean. Any other questions? Uh, anything from Zoom land out there? No. Okay. All right, well, uh, we shall move on to our business items. And um, I'd like to ask Trustee Cobb if she would introduce uh, Betsy Dittenberg and talk a little bit about what you've been working on. Sure. Um, Betsy, thank you for coming tonight. I, uh, she, Betsy's been here before, so she may not need an introduction, but she's the executive director of the Chaffee County Community Foundation. And um, we've just completed um, the uh, reviews for the and, and recommendations for the spring, spring uh, municipal grants. And um, before you have your say, Betsy, I, I just would like to compliment you and thank you for what I think was a really impressive process. Um, really well organized, um, respectful and supportive of both the grantees and the reviewers. Um, you were a tireless and skillful guider for the review team. So I really appreciate that. I just appreciate your stewardship of the uh, funding that Buena Vista is able to provide for these for these uh, purposes. And for me personally, it was a privilege really to participate um, and work with Betsy and the, her team and the rest of the reviewers. <clears throat> and I'm just gonna take a minute and go ahead and talk some more, but mm -hmm. I learned an awful lot about the local nonprofits and all that they do to support our community. And it made me feel proud and fortunate all over again to live here. Um, it's sobering to read in the grant proposals, the descriptions of need among some in our community, but I was really impressed at the meaningful and wide ranging support that our community or that exists here for a lot of these, these needs. Um, just a quick summary, this year's proposals addressed everything from childcare, housing, people with disabilities, youth development, mental health, arts and culture, education, recreation, agricultural, agriculture, animal welfare, environmental protection, support for seniors, support for people experiencing very specific types of crises and those with basic food and clothing needs. Um, some of these grantees, as you probably are aware, uh, operate on a pretty large scale, but others um, kind of uh, fill a very small but critical niche that would be really a loss if we, if we couldn't help them out. Um, <clears throat> there are lots of creative ideas, impressive projects and programs, and I would say each one of them that I reviewed, and we all reviewed at some level, all of them, I guess, um, reflected a passion for helping people in need and or for enriching our lives in some other way. Um, I'm also really pleased that the process allowed us to provide operating support because I think that's always needed by nonprofits and many grants don't, don't cover that. So thank you to the board, the town and the foundation for making it possible. And for the colleague, my colleagues, if you haven't been a reviewer, um, I encourage you to try it sometime. It's a pretty special experience. So Betsy, sorry to help I didn't steal any of your thunder there. <laughs> Thank you to the trustees and the Mayor Faye for having um, me here today. And for that lovely introduction, I feel <laughs> intimidated following that. <laughs> so, um, you know, I do, I do appreciate, you know, your, your thoughts on it. It is such a difficult process to go through and decide the funds and we do try to provide as much structure around that so that we can go through um you know not just a formula but just a process to narrow down to those final award amounts and and um i love the fact that you're encouraging your colleagues to consider being part of the process and hopefully we'll be able to find you know we'd love to have you back or mayor Fay back but if anyone else would like to be part of the process we'd really appreciate it it is such an inspiring system to go through to see just all the work that these folks are doing and hear the passion in their grant applications. Um, and it is very difficult to go through and narrow down to those final award amounts. So thank you for your hard work. And I also wanted to give a quick thank you to um, Kate Garwood, Cecilia LaFrance, Carol Ann Soltz, Becky Rupp, Rick Hamilton, Chrissy Supples, Representative Pappenfort from Salida, um, and of course, Trustee Cobb for your participation on the committee. Um, each gave uh, at least 25 hours in the review process over the past two months, um, and we did arrive at the, the final reviews last week. Uh, so with that, 
Just a quick recap, there were 47 applications for funding. Two of the applicants did not have complete applications. Um, six were not recommended for funding and 31 applicants were allocated funding from the Buena Vista Community Grants Fund, totaling 57,871. Um, we, you know, I know we shared the materials in the spreadsheet and um, a part of the process that we went through in deciding the funds is looking at the population <laughs> served from each community. Uh, we've heard a lot of really great feedback from the applicants that having one process as opposed to two is really beneficial for them so that they're not doing twice the amount of work for, um, for a, you know, essentially small amounts of funds. Um, and so what we did was look at the percent served of residents by each organization and then award the funds um, approximately based on that percentage. So for instance, if you look at the um, at newbies who serves, they indicated 90% um, newbie residents, there was the vast majority of that funding came out of the BV fund versus only $350, which came out of the Salida fund. So it's just a little bit of how we broke down those award amounts. Um, another thing which Trustee Cobb pointed out is that we are awarding as much as we can operating funds because that is a hole, that's a gap in the funding opportunities for nonprofit organizations. Things like copiers, keeping on the lights that you know, are, are really essential to keeping these organizations running, um, but are not always, uh, uh, there's not always great opportunities out there for other grant funding. And so that is a, a huge gap that this community grants program is filling in our community. Uh, I'm happy to entertain any questions that anyone has about the grant funding process, but I do just want to share how how grateful we are that you trust us with the um, the administration of the community grants program, and we really appreciate your partnership in that. It's really helped to have the foundation be involved in the process, and I'd I'd like to mention that um, Trustee Jenkins has also been a reviewer in the past. <coughs> So we put 1% of our sales tax revenue plus some actual line item budget contributions. It's very helpful to staff as well, because, you know, as you know, we get lots of requests and people coming in and um, there's only so much in the budget. So if we just can do this lump sum and then put it in the hands of of the community foundation and then we also have a trustee that can join them so we know that all of the decisions that you know are carried over that we would like so that's helpful to staff and i appreciate that about you Betsy. Thank you. any questions for betsy for the process thank you betsy thank you betsy <laughs> All right, the, the next item will involve um, uh, school superintendent Lisa Yates, as well as um, Chief Dean Morgan of the police department, the University of Police Department, and the uh, school resource officer, Jake England. Um, and it has to do with um, considering the adoption of a tobacco ordinance. So I hand it over to you three. Okay, real quick. Um, I saw there was a chief's report on the agenda. Did, um, did that get missed or? Uh, it was part of the consent agenda. Oh, okay. But if you'd like to talk about it, we'd love to hear. No, I just wanted to note that it's in there. So if anyone has any questions, reach out and ask. So um, I'll start off on the tobacco ordinance. Um, real quick. Um, in 2020, my understanding was that the tobacco ordinance was rescinded, and we'd like to bring it back. Um, specifically in the schools, there's some issues with tobacco use, especially vaping, and I'll have uh, Superintendent Yates speak to that. And I also have uh, Jake, our school resource officer here, to speak to some of that. My understanding was the intent in 2020, I'm not sure why it came up, but the intent to rescind it was, I, I think the board at the time felt that it would be better to target um, people who were selling to kids as opposed to actually um, dealing with issues with kids that have tobacco in their possession or if they're using it. Um, just in my experience, there's not a, we're not seeing a big issue with people selling tobacco to kids. If kids wanna get tobacco, they're gonna get a hold of it in a lot of different ways. Um, we have done some liquor stains in the past where we have targeted tobacco 
And a lot of the stores, their cash registers and things are actually set up where you have to scan an ID, like at City Market, even if you try to buy um, cough syrup, usually you have to, you know, have somebody come and key that in. So in our experience, that's not where we're seeing kids get tobacco. They're getting it from family, they're getting it from friends, maybe they're having somebody go into a store and buy it for them. Um, so that is still on the books and we, we would still enforce that. Um, but the issue is when it becomes disruptive at school, um, again, our intent is not to, to create a big hassle for kids that are using tobacco, but it's also a pretty damaging habit to start in school. And there's a lot of kids I, I know, I mean, I smoked myself for five years back in the day. I'm, I'm glad I quit. I know a lot of people that have commented that they wish they never started. And this is a way they're seeing enough of it that um, we're looking at some strategies where you know, there can be some type of accountability for tobacco use when they're caught with it. And at the school, um, especially at the school resource officer, we work pretty closely with them. So the process there is with vaping incidents, they will um, get a warning the first time and some in-school type of uh, discipline. And we're fine with that. But if it continues, then um, in the past, before 2020, we would always write them a summons into municipal court. And then there'd be a more... Uh, serious consequence as opposed to just an in-school thing because clearly they're not getting the message. And I talked to the uh, town prosecutor um, if anyone has any questions of what those consequences might look like. And again, it's, it's things like restorative justice, taking a class um, that she mentioned through uh, public safety on the dangers of smoking. Um, and it could also be a fine and continued education and things like that. So nothing draconian, but something <laughs> that gives us a tool. But the one other thing I wanted to mention is you know, with any crime, the police can seize something that was used in the commission of a crime. So the statute, there's a couple different verbiages here that we can discuss or that I guess the board would look at at a later date if they decide to approve this. But one of the verbiages um, is possession is illegal for those 18 or under 18. So even if the police decided to just give a written warning, we can also seize the, the items at that point too, as this is something illegal to possess, therefore we're going to take it. That's another aspect of the ordinance. Um, I'll turn it over if you're good, uh, Ms. Yates, to talk about the school aspect of this. Oh, sure. If you're good with that, Mayor. Yes, that's good. Please, would you like to speak from the podium? Sure, you bet. Uh, and first, before speaking specifically to um, the vaping issue and our our hope that the town would reconsider the ordinance as it currently is. Um, I want to give thanks for the relationship that we do have. Uh, in particular, um, Officer England has done a great job of stepping into the role when um, I don't know if she's still officer or what her title is, Mitchell. <laughs> um, he just did a great job of stepping in and now having the two of them being able to know our staff well, um, getting to know students. Some of the comments that we hear about Officer England is the way that he is very visible. And um, I think as we have been seeing in the sad recent news, that matters tremendously. Um, any ways that we can deter or give someone um, the warning that it would not be good for them to come into a building um, is, is important. So we're taking all the steps that we can and so very grateful for everything you've done um, and for the strong relationship that we have, which allows us to even have the confidence as a school to come and say, um, yes, we hope that there would be additional ordinances around possession. I think three or four years ago, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be saying that because I would be afraid um, because of the break in our relationship or that it hadn't been um, developed at the time, that there would be um, too severe of punishment for kids as opposed to how can we come around the students um, when they could be dabbling in risky behaviors. And so I feel like we have strongly established a relationship where I have as much confidence in um, the intent of our law enforcement as I do um, of, of my own staff in the school district. So as it currently is, we of course are a tobacco and alcohol free um, campus that is situated within, an, within a community that has a message that is saying it's actually okay 
um, if you are underage to possess a vape or tobacco item. And a lot of things can go in those vapes. Um, so we are left as a school district to use our own consequences, which are things like um, suspensions, which it would be really nice if we had things besides just being removed from school to bring supports around. It's wonderful when a family can be involved in this and, and sees the seriousness of once you start into risky behavior, what that can lead to. Um, there are times when we don't have that family support. And so we are left to um, the internal consequences of things like missing your sports activities, um, being ineligible to participate in prom. All of those could still happen if, this, if there was also um, legal consequences behind it. But what we found in our experience, and I would use truancy of what's happening in our county with truancy, um, we are taking families to court for not sending their students to school. COVID has been hard for everyone to re-engage back in our community. And Judge Murphy has been extremely helpful in not punishing the family or the students unless that's necessary, but involving other resources that we have in our community, like in-home counseling or FYI, or whatever that particular situation is that's keeping the family from engaging in school and they want to be solved. Last night at our board meeting, we had a student from CCHS who was taken to truancy court by her principal and came to the board to offer her thanks for what the school is doing. Um, and that is because there's legal ramifications for not attending school, not necessarily for the students, for the family, but the student um, was able to see it um, for the help that it's done. So it would be helpful that we had um, the resources that are available in our community besides just using the consequences of school. And then secondly, I think we're, it's when, when we tell students very clearly, or youth, I should say, when we tell youth very clearly that this is a behavior or this is an, a habit that is not healthy for your, for especially at this age that you are, it's very clear but we have mis mixed messages right now. We, we are saying that um, you shouldn't, people shouldn't be selling it to you, um, but it's by the wording that's in here, it can be interpreted by a child that it's okay for you to have it. And we really don't have the um, legal teeth that we need to be able to do that. So we go through the warning process, we go through suspensions, um, but eventually we are we are out of the consequences and we're on our own is what it feels like. We are as a school trying to reform this behavior. So I think we can be really clear with youth um, that this is an unsafe, unhealthy behavior when you're this age. Um, and I, I think, as you said, when we have um, us as adults coming around students to say, this is these are the resources available to get help, um, it would really matter. So. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna speak. Um, I thought under Duff Lacey as mayor that we did not allow cigarette smoking in any of the public parks, the river park, that it's not allowed there. So what are we going for now that is more than what was already there? Because I'm sure that we had because I remember voting on it. That I'm thinking that this ordinance that's in our packet now. And it's from is, 2015. Yeah, that, that's what we passed under uh, Mayor Lacey. I, I can speak to that if you need to. So, Mary Jo Bennett's on it. So it's even older than that. Yeah. I think the one from Mary Jo was when it was um, illegal, period, for. Um, underage to possess. And then I think in 2020, they amended it to just sales was illegal. We do have an ordinance that makes it illegal to smoke in the city parks. And then Colorado law has it illegal. Um, I think it's the Clean Air Act to smoke in the building. So um, Jake might be able to speak to this, but um, what they're seeing is a lot of the kids possessing it in the school and having smoked it in the buildings. Um, what an ordinance like this would do would make it universally illegal in the town limits for um, uh, juveniles under the age of 18 to use or possess anywhere in town. So like right now, if there were kids smoking at the skate park, we could enforce that because of their park. 
Um, but if we do a traffic stop, for example, and there's kids that are vaping, um, things like that, we could address at that time and say, hey, you guys can't, we can't possess it. We could cite them for it if we wanted to or take it from them. So it would make it not just the parks, but anywhere in town. What sort of a process do you go through to discover that they that they have a, a hidden uh, vaping pen? Do you want to talk about that at the school? Yeah. Um, so at the school, um, I've never seen a problem like this until I got into the, uh, the schools and it, it came right out of the gate um, right away. At the beginning of the semester, it was more prominent. It's kind of died down after we've had these conversations. But um, man, we were catching probably one a week for there for a while. I think I tallied up the um, the reports and stuff, and we had we've had twelve in the first semester alone. And that's just the reports. So it's not the ones that uh, we've got tips and we've investigated. That's there's a couple actually in the middle school as well that um, the school handled before I, I even um, knew about it. But with the, unlike cigarettes, which is not the problem in their school, it's not cigarettes, it's these e-cigarettes, these vape pens. Um, so unlike cigarettes, where you're obviously gonna smell that um, cigarette smoke, you're gonna see it uh, linger more. These vapes are very easy to conceal and they're very easy to um, discreetly uh, take a puff. Um, you could do it in the hallway while you're walking to the bathroom. Nobody would ever know. It evaporates pretty quickly. Doesn't really leave um, any kind of smell. So our problem is they're, they're going to the bathroom, able to hit it. Um, I have no evidence because by the time somebody goes in there, there's no smoke, there's no smell. Um, so what we've been doing is the principal um, with these tips has been talking to the kids um, with me there um, and just asking them about it. And the majority of them are, uh, are uh, saying, yeah, I did it. Um, and they're turning the vapes over. Um, and our big thing is like uh, Chief Morgan said and like Superintendent Shade said, um, we're not about punishment. It's not the crime of the century. I'm not looking to crack down on vaping. Uh, but what I do is take it as an opportunity to um, teach them a little bit about the consequences of, you know, legally getting into something else or just as your body, the consequences you can face there. Um, so that's what we were, we've been doing. And then I found out that there actually was no teeth at all for repeat offenders. Um, luckily we have <coughs> had out of those 12 that I've done actual reports on, we've only had one repeat offender. Um, so I think that talking to them, giving them that, hey, one chance, it's gonna be, this is your warning. Um, if it happens again, there could be different consequences. And those consequences, again, aren't supposed to be some kind of punishment, more along the lines of putting them in front of a judge, um, giving them those resources, maybe giving them that little kick to start those resources and, and help them from there, so. Yeah, good. I just, you know, I, I hate the idea of uh, just suspending children because we want them to be in school. We want them to graduate and have successful lives. So, other uh, comments? Um, yeah, other I have a couple of questions. Would this be, I mean, would these kinds of consequences be uh, in, in front of the suspensions and the denial of sports participation, or what would they be? Would they follow that? So with the ordinance, no. So that would be um, in-school discipline, mm -hmm. which we don't really um, have a say in. So this would be a uh, second offense, and they're just not getting the message or they're continuing to be disruptive in school with this behavior. Um, then um, in tandem with the school, um, the SRO could write a summons and that they would appear in this building here in front of um, our municipal judge, Judge Green. And in, in coordination with the uh, town prosecutor, um, things would be offered, like I said, the restorative justice option, classes and things like that outside of school. Um, and to address your question as well, Mayor, you know, how, how do we catch this? Like on a traffic stop, um, there's a legal term called the plain view doctrine. If we see kids driving and there's a vape device in their car, and then the ordinance says it's illegal to possess that, then we can address that then and there. And it, it's up to the officer. You know, at that point, they have discretion. They could write the, the juvenile summons into court, or they could say, hey, 
this is a bad idea and you can't possess that in town because you're not 18. So that goes with us. And at least we can remove the product from them. So I'm still a little bit unclear, just to uh, Mayor Faye's point, um, I do want to see the kids stay in school. So I guess I would ask uh, Superintendent Yates if, um, if you would, I mean, if, what, would, what would be the first action? It would be the, the discussion with uh, Officer England. And then the second one, would there possibly be suspension or would it go, uh, I mean, how, how does that? We, we might likely have school consequences as well. Okay. Um, if, I'm assuming that they would, it would like have an MIP is what would happen if it was a second or third offense and they had decided to ticket. And we do have a matrix if someone has an MIP, um, especially for extracurricular activities, that's when we say um, that's a privilege to be part of that activity. And so likely there would be a consequence there. But the bigger thing is that the family is now engaged or there's a better chance that there is. So even if there's a one day suspension, it feels like that suspension is gonna have more um, impact because they're also talking with the police or talking with the courts where in, instead there are times when it's just the let's go home and we'll, we'll take the vape home and you don't see the consequence. And it, it feels like it's the school that cares about the vape instead of the community. Uh, MIT, uh, just for my edification. Oh, minor in possession. Okay. Oh, MIP. Right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you can tell I was good at two shoes. No. Just... <laughs> <laughs> you probably okay. were. Thanks. <laughs> well, actually, I, I'm sorry. I do have another question, but I'm also willing to let someone else talk. I have a question. I have a question just for clarity. It sounds like this is more, it's less of a public nuisance problem because you're saying it's vaping, so the vapor goes away. It's not a secondhand smoke thing. It's more more of a public health thing we're kind of going after now, if I'm not mistaken, or also because you could be vaping, you know, weed instead of tobacco. And so this kind of cracks down on all that, if I'm not mistaken, it, just to make sure what we're talking, it's more about public health and not a public nuisance necessarily. In my mind, I think outside of the school, it would be um, kind of a public nuisance thing and a public health thing in the school. Um, and you, you might speak to this more than I can, but it, it can be disruptive to the overall environment um, on top of this is an unhealthy habit for, you know, like I said, public health for um, young people to get into. Yeah, and at the school, we've had a few um, students who have come, and come to me and said, hey, I went into the bathroom, so-and-so was vaping, made me feel super uncomfortable, made them fear, um, fearful um, that they're around that, uh, that they were gonna get in trouble as well. Um, so I would say that it's a, a disruption at school as well. That stands. And, and to answer your question also, um, Trustee Cobb, um, Superintendent Gates is correct. It, it does engage the parents more because if a juvenile is issued a summons, their parents have to appear with him. So it, it does engage the family more. And again, if it's becoming so problematic that it's not being addressed at the school level, it's good to get that family involvement where uh oh, now dad has to take off work and come with little Johnny to court because he keeps smoking in the bathroom type of dynamic. Okay. Other um, comment or question? I guess the other thing I'd ask is, if, um, is would there be any sort of outreach or um, notices or some kind of pro, well, both uh, heads up that this was happening? Would that be some kind of notice there or outreach and also just outreach? on why it's being done and some, some education to kind of help these kids in addition to uh, the, the enforcement. I can say from our perspective, it was a surprise to us that uh, actually through uh, Jake that we that the ordinance was no longer there because it hasn't been too long since we were not using um, police to be able to help us with this. Okay. So I don't know that there's a, a the broader parent community yet knows um, of, about this reality. Certainly the ones that we've worked with. Yeah. But it hasn't been that long. I believe legally we'd have to do some uh, posting about it. Mr. Parker might be able to address that, but um, on our end, we absolutely want to educate. You know, we could put it, you know, social media, different things and say, uh, like even back to school, like maybe some handouts sure. and saying, hey, this is a new ordinance. 
just be aware, you know, help us, help the school, help you. Don't don't bring this stuff on the school property. Don't engage in this type of behavior. You got nothing to worry about. It's my understanding that it has become a huge problem, the vaping by uh, middle school and high school kids particularly. Um, and I would hope that the board would uh, come to a conclusion that we need stricter ordinances than what we have. Mayor okay. Trustee Jenkins, do I have a question or two? Yes, please. Yeah, um, question beyond the school, just in private, you know, walking down streets and stuff like that. Um, I was just curious how the chief, how they handle, you know, like a vaping person or is walking down the street or something like that. Um, what, what kind of enforcement's involved there? It would be very similar to open use of marijuana. So um, we have that sometimes at some of the festivals and things. Um, people will, you know, blaze up the doobie and uh, can't do that. It's illegal. So um, usually, I mean, it kind of depends. It's officer discretion. Usually we just give them a warning and say, hey, you can't do that here. Um, with a kid, um, with marijuana, that would be a minor in possession um, citation. But if it's just a vape device, we'd probably just take it and book it into our evidence for destruction and at least take it from them. And we can issue a written warning, which goes in our system that shows, hey, this person's been given a warning by the police. Um, and if it persists, it, it'd probably be the same as what we've done at the school is now we talk to you, that was your, your first chance. Now the second chance, maybe maybe you get the message by talking to the judge. Right. And, and do you take that device away from them, Chief? Or are they allowed to keep that? Like, a, you know, a student wouldn't be able to, obviously. Yeah, now they're, they're allowed to keep it. Um, there's no law okay. that makes it illegal to possess. So by asking to bring this ordinance back, it says it's illegal to use or possess. Um, and it, it defines it um, under the 2020 version, um, what an e-cigarette is. So all kinds of tobacco products will be covered. So we could we could seize it. And, and two, Lisa, could you do me a favor and go to the new ordinance? I was just curious about locations where this would be uh, enforced. Are you on a particular? Are you looking? Are you looking for the so, number two there, public property? Yeah, number two. Thank you. Yeah, I was just wanted to read up on that, and make sure everybody feels good with what's covered there. Right. It excludes streets, sidewalks, and alleys. Yeah, I don't like that at all. Yeah, that's. I guess that's why I wanted to bring that to attention because I read that too. I was curious. And again, that, that's part of this discussion is to talk about those things. So that can be looked at. I don't know if Jeff has thoughts on that. Well, I mean, just to, just to be clear, there's, there's there are two sections of the municipal code that deal with use of tobacco products. And the one you're looking at right now, it covers basically public parks and open spaces and it applies to everybody, minors or not. And I think that, um, I mean, sure, they can look at that and talk about if you want to expand that or change that. But um, the provision that deals with minors is a different section of the town code. And that basically changed in 2020, um, partly in response to state legislation in uh, you know, 2020 that basically increased the um, minimum age for the sale of tobacco products from 18 to 21. And that that legislation actually eliminated state criminalization of possession of um, tobacco products by minors and focused more on the sale to minors. And I think the town, you know, then the town had to increase its age from 18 to 21 um, for the sale to, to minors. And then along with that, the town eliminated the penalties on possession by minors kind of following what I guess was the logic of the state legislature. Um, so I guess the, the real question I think right now at least is whether you wanna bring the possession prohibition back. Um, and you can define what you want minor to be. It can be eight, you know, under eight, 18 and under, or it can be 21 and under. Um, and then I guess a secondary issue with, which trustee Jenkins just raised is do we wanna look at like just the general smoking prohibition? Um, in the town 
And so that's kind of a secondary issue. Hope I didn't just confuse everybody more. No, that was good. <laughs> Jeff, are, um, is it convenient for you to tell us what um, sections of the municipal code are involved in those two uh, Okay. Yeah. So I think, the, the, I think it's I think it's ten one eighty five that we're looking at. Because if you just scroll um, up to on the page there, I think the one that we're looking at about prohibited. Yeah. Yeah. Ten one eighty five is a general prohibition on smoking in public places, and then I think it's ten two fifty seven, if I'm not mistaken. And pull it up real quick. Yeah, 10257 is the uh is the um just the underage sale prohibitions that kind of at one point they had had it had another another line in there basically that made it uh a municipal offense for minors to possess and use tobacco products. And then when the law changed in 2020 to increase the age from 18 to 21, that's when that possession um provision got de deleted. From 10 257. And is there a reason that um, item two uh, under that 10 185, is there a reason that it excludes sidewalks, streets, and alleys? You know, I think we were more looking at it as sort of places of congregation, parks, outdoor areas. I, I honestly, it was 2014, I think, or 2015, maybe. I don't really recall. There may be some whereas clauses at the beginning of that that might give us a little heads up as to what the reason was for that, but um, I honestly don't don't have a great answer for that. Can I talk for a minute? Please. Um, I was 14 years old when I started smoking. I have never been able to quit, and it is an addiction. I would be the first one to stand up in front of high school kids and say, never start. And I do think that we need to protect our youth. If they can make it to 21 without smoking, they'll probably be smoke free most of their lives. Um, to go completely overboard, when I first became a board member, I went over to Glenwood Springs on community builders housing. We stayed in downtown Glenwood Springs. Absolutely no smoking. I was taken over there in a company vehicle and we did not smoke in the company vehicle. I was the only smoker there. But at the desk, I asked the lady at the desk, um, where did I need to go for a smoke to have a cigarette? And her response to me was, that direction, walk until you no longer feel safe. Oh, great. Now, is that how you're going to treat tourists to your community? Because I did not feel welcome there. I realized that smoking is a nasty habit, and I am very careful about how and who I smoke around people. Um, but you're not going to kill their addiction by telling them that they cannot smoke in the street. And if you're worried about some people would not spend their tourist dollars here under those conditions. So I thought, am I a chicken and walk a block and get picked up for smoking because that wasn't far enough? Or does she know something that I don't know? Is there a part of this town that isn't safe? Or do I hoof it two miles and then I'm okay to smoke? So, so in protecting protecting our kids, smokers are human beings, whether it's a nasty habit or not. And you, the, if they outlined smoking in all of Buena Vista, it would be against the law for me to truly smoke in my backyard. And I will smoke somewhere. Just like when I leave a restaurant and all I can smell is marijuana, they're not being that is an issue in our town too, that you, you don't want that smell. So just keep in the back of your minds that they're human beings too. Thank you. Other comments, questions? Just, just briefly on that, we, I don't think um, we're asking that it's prohibiting smoking in town, it's just specific to juveniles. And then the Colorado, I think it's the Clean Air Act, I was just looking it up on my phone. 
prohibit it's anywhere indoors. And I think it's, I, don't quote me on this, but I think it's within 15 feet of a business. Um, and that's a state one. And so, we did right. we did pass that you cannot, nobody can smoke in a park. And I'm all for that because you have little kids playing in the park and you don't need a bunch of adults smoking in the park. So there are areas that it, that you know we are not supposed to smoke and that's that's a good thing. That is a good thing. Questions, comments? Zoom, Zoom guys, got anything? What's the, uh, um, the, oh, you can go ahead, Mark. No, go ahead, Devin, I already spoke. Oh yeah, I was just having a question what the direction you're looking for. Um, do we need to make a new ordinance? Do we need to tell you to move forward? What's the direction you're looking for? Yeah, right, right now we don't seem to have an ordinance that has to do with possession of um, electronic cigarettes or other vaping devices and, and uh, tobacco products. So that would be yeah. one thing we'd be looking for, for about youth, however we define that, to be age 18 or age 21. <coughs> Don't you have to be 21 to buy cigarettes now? I, I believe that was um, what Mr. Parker said, uh, that's a state law. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Well, so it should affect people that are <coughs> 21 and below. So my, not be my allowed thought, to possess. I apologize. <coughs> my, my thought would be is that we don't um, discuss it and then I could talk to the town prosecutor and Mr. Parker and we would draft an ordinance if the board's good with that and we bring it back at another time for, you know, to vote on it um, with some new verbiage. So do we need to make a motion for them to proceed with that? I would certainly accept a motion to that effect, yeah. Well, I think Peter has a comment. Well, just do, is there more direction that's needed before you go? Because I know, Cindy, you just mentioned the 21, or so that's the legal age to purchase this, so that should be under. I mean, I kind of think it's more 18 and under of possession, but that would be kind of my thoughts. So do we want to have that discussion now or have the ordinance come and then we can then discuss kind of specifics on that some of the other elements not just the age but that would be involved in it i think this would be a good time to give direction to staff on what you would like to see in the ordinance and particularly with the alleys and roadways uh you know if there's some comments you might have there and i, I don't want to mix the two ordinances up at the same time Anything, any comments you give us now will be helpful. Mm -hmm. How many students do you have who are 18 years old? Um, I don't know for sure. I would say our senior class is 70. So I would say that over half of those. So those students would be okay if, if we go with 18. Fair. I was also just thinking of I guess thinking all the different people who come here in summer for who are over the age 18 that, you know, aren't from here necessarily, but you know what? I guess it's not a big of a deal. It makes sense to keep it at 18, though, if you don't want to have it so half of your senior class can vote and have possession and the other half can't, and then you're having a hard time battling back and forth, I guess. I mean, we, we wouldn't allow them to smoke. It's on our campus, but they could. Yeah, it, that, that's, that's the mis me messaging is that it's just the school that's the head. Yeah. Um, okay, do we have specifics on what we'd like to ask staff to bring back to us? Um, possession, um, definitely in, in school use in school, um, public parks. Might be part of that. I mean, the request well, I think is just parks in town. Parks the one ordinance already, so this would be expanding upon, it, correct me if I'm wrong, Jeff, but this would be expanding upon the uh, 10257. 
That's right. It really, it really wouldn't be addressing 10185. It wouldn't be addressing the locations. It would just basically be addressing what age is it legal or illegal to possess tobacco products, just generally in the whole town. And that would be 10257. We don't have that in here, so my apologies. Um, but that would be the, the correct ordinance that uh -huh. would be adapting then. Could maybe pull that up uh, on the okay. municipal code. Put it on the screen. So. Got a copy here I can pass around to. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I mean, right right now, 10257 basically defines what a tobacco product is, and it includes like the e-cigarettes and vaping devices, you know, anything that delivers nicotine or tobacco, kind of like it, it would, it just sort of, it's a pretty standard definition. And then it basically just addresses like how it's illegal for somebody to sell it, you know, or furnish it to them. Um, and, and it basically elim eliminates the, this, the possession. So what you could do is just you know add another subsection that would basically say it's illegal for anyone under the age of 18 or 21 or whatever you guys agree on to possess uh, tobacco products. It'd be like a, a one-line addition. Um, it would subject those people to the same penalties as the general penalties are, which are which are huge, but are basically never ever imposed by municipal court. So the court would have discretion and. They could do the restorative justice route and you know public service, education, that kind of thing. But I mean, my my thought would be is that if you want to do this, you'd just be basically adding a new subsection to section 10257. That sounds good to me. I hate to be a killjoy, yep. but it also include anything else in those in the vaping devices. I mean, you mentioned that there are other things probably. Yeah, I mean, I mean, right now what, what it would basically it would just basically tobacco. outlaw the possession of the, what's called, what's defined to be a tobacco product. And if, if you're interested, I can read it to you. It's a little long, but it's basically a tobacco product is any product which contained, which contains is made or derived from tobacco or used to deliver nicotine, synthetic nicotine or other substances intended for human consumption, whether heated, chewed, absorbed, dissolved, inhaled, snorted, sniffed, or ingested by other means. I'm going to keep going for a minute here, but not limited to cigarettes, cigars, little cigars, chewing tobacco, pipe tobacco, and it goes into all kinds of stuff. Or then it says, or um, uh, an electronic smoking device. And electronic smoking device is then defined to be your kind of e-cigarettes, vaping devices and everything. Um, so it really pretty much covers what we've been talking about tonight. Okay. So we're conflicted about the 18 versus 21. I mean, I mean it's not a hell all done. I just tend to believe if you get drafted into war, you should be able to make a decision about smoking. That's, <laughs> that's kind of where I fall on the whole 18 and below things. Is we think you're adult enough to go serve your serve your country in the military, we should be able to think you can make a choice on having a vape pen or not. But I also understand the conf conflicting views of your classmates being able to, and then others not being able to. So. Ken, you have signs at school that say no vaping devices are allowed in school grounds. Yes. Even even if the law, even if the law that we pass says um, twenty one or eighteen, I guess our law would say eighteen. Right. The school district retains authority to regulate its schools as it deems fit. So you know they could do okay. whatever they think is appropriate. Okay, but then can I mean, can the enforcement happen here if it needs to? If we can only enforce our codes, we can't enforce school district rules. So if you if you know if the if the town wants to be able to enforce a prohibition on possession of tobacco products by minors, you have to have a town code that does that. What the school district does, you have no authority to enforce. We have that language up now for you, so you can see it in the municipal code if you if you want to just roll a glance at it. Yeah, sorry, I, I tried to read you the uh, the uh, cliff note version of that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So that has twenty one years in it. So we would be changing that 
possibly to 18. No, no, just yeah. to be clear, you, you can't change um, it to 18 for the sale oh, of tobacco sure. products because that's statewide. That's a state rule. State but if you wanted to address possession, it would be different. It's not really governed by state law directly anymore. And so you could very likely, you could make it 18 because um, it's a different, a different issue, not governed by state law anymore. So it'd be like a, sec a subsection in here. Yeah, exactly. To be clear, I was saying that would, my choice of it, but I understand where people are coming from for 21 and how it would be conflicting in the school district as well. If other people agree with me, then that's fine too. But I'm just I'm not going to have a stink on it, and I understand where it's coming from. And and I do take your point, but I guess I would ask if we're not sort of um, in the same boat that we're in now. If we say 18 and you say 21, but we can't, I mean, chief, the uh, police can't enforce that. Is that our? Is that right? You're over eight. Well, or, we say you can't smoke no matter how old you are. You can't. You can't use any. Sure. Um, so. Um, we just would not be able to use the reinforcement of police and judges if someone was um, over 18. Think? Um, no, I think um, I, I tend to agree with uh, Mr. Or Trustee Hilton Hinga that you know if you can serve your country in war, you can make a decision about smoking. So um, the state law says you can't sell um, to under 21, and that is what it is. Um, I would feel like possession um, 18 and under um, is um, is the route to go as far as, you know, if we catch people like that. Um, as far as enforcing that the, at the school, we could enforce that at the school if that was a municipal ordinance, if an 18-year-old was smoking, or I'm sorry, 17-year-old or whatever was smoking. Um, outside of that, if people at the school over 18 are smoking, um, again, that's the school's decision to, to address and we can, you know, step in and ask people politely, but outside of that, there's no legal recourse. Okay. Okay. Let's try to wrap this up. <laughs> Does anyone have a proposal they'd like to make in the form of a motion? I would like to make a motion that they proceed with, um, I'm going to say building an ordinance to, for people under the age of 18 um, and bring it back to us later to vote on them. Okay, is there a second to Cindy's motion? Second. So we've got Swisher Cobb. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Thank you. Great. Thank Just, you. Thanks. Thank so you. that gives you some guidance anyway. Thank you. Okay. All right. So um, now we have uh, had some people patiently waiting and, yes. <laughs> and Lisa's uh, going to guide us through it. Uh, Yes. An idea on Orion Integration Services. Yes, and we have with us Patrick Jackson, president of Orion, and Jesse and Stephanie, which you know very well uh, from the team. And this is an item that we briefly discussed before um, as a potential thing that we might do, kind of depending on performance and how things were going. And so I put kind of a report card <laughs> summary in here, which is glaring because they've done a fantastic job of um, coming in and incorporating. Um, and they have background, I think that's been very helpful in local government um, IT, which is very um, specific. And it's a skill set that, you know, not all of the IT providers have. But the other key aspect of that is that they also have two very local right here in BB. Um, so both Jesse and Stephanie are here locally and able to respond very quickly. Um, so the, the item really here tonight is to exercise 
your provision in the um, town of Big BV purchasing policy. It's section four, formal bidding required A, 4A. And it basically says that town board can determine that the public interest will be best served by negotiating a contract with a single vendor or a contractor or with specific vendors or contractors possessing unique skills or products or by joint purchase uh, with or from another unit of government. And in this case, of course, it will be a single vendor or contractor um, and unique skills. And so I've kind of given you background on why I think they are unique uh, in that they are the one provider that is also servicing uh, Salida. Um, they've done some work for Poncha. Um, and of course, when we were researching um, what we were going to do after Michael gave his resignation, um, they just really stepped up to the plate and came in and were willing to do a, a short-term contract with us so that we could get a feel for, for what they could do. Uh, within 24 hours, they responded after um, our little emergency meeting to kind of discuss the course of action. Um, they came on site and they did an audit and they met every single uh, department and kind of assessed the needs. Um, and then not only that, they've done a really great job of, there were just many vendors and subcontractors that we were working with before in order to maintain all the services that we needed to do with just a one man shop. And so they've really done, Jesse's done a fantastic job of interfacing with all of those um, subcontractors <laughs> like the and um, just previous uh, subcontractors that had been utilized and kind of getting a feel for, you know, if this is duplicate to what we can provide, then maybe we think about in the future, you know, tapering off of that or what can they still give us? So we've had to kind of work together and he does a great job of, of providing me that information of here, Lisa, is an area we can save. So there's been a lot of actually cost savings that I think have come with this, but still providing the services that, that we require and need for a town of um, a town hall with you know practically 45 bodies, um, and then including the board of trustees as well, because you all have a device. So, um, but there were there were some savings that are very very significant, and so and then on top of that, um, I've given you sort of an assessment of you know there there hasn't been any sort of incidents or negligence on their part in performance. Uh, if there was anything, it was just a lost in translation and trying to transition. And all of that was mitigated very quickly. Um, and so it's my recommendation, actually my high, <laughs> highest recommendation that you just approve a uh, sole source um, so that we can move forward, Jeff and I <coughs> with working uh, with Patrick um, on a longer term contract um, and so that we can just um, supersede the formal bidding process at this point. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any comments? Just just one question, just the, the filming of the meetings, which I see we've got to, you know, Chase is here. Yeah. Like we have a couple of folks that can, can help with that. Um, how often do we see needing Brian to, to do that? It's a very good question. Um, so originally I thought that we would need to interface with them a little bit more and have them here. <clears throat> but, you know, we, Stephanie came in, uh, I guess it was one of the first meetings um, after they started and kind of watched and observed and where can we, you know, make things more efficient. And then we went through the ground rules. And so it's really working very well to have Chase run the Zoom. And um, we talked just today, Jesse and I, about you know getting some uh, getting some cameras potentially or a software program that will allow Chase and Annie to just do zooming in on the camera and just do a little bit of that as well. And so I don't think that we'll probably need them for the full meeting. They've stayed for the full meeting because this was a big item for them, and that shows the the importance, the level of importance. I really consider them, you know, a teammate. I know um, that Patrick, I think, made the comment when he came to visit that, you know, 
we don't want to just be your consultant. We want to be a team member and we want you to think of us as a team member. And they really do exude that. And um, their help, the help ticket system is amazing just for staff in general uh, to be able to respond quickly. Uh, I've had no complaints from department heads and I got a couple of emails from department heads, asked them to send me any emails before this meeting on any thoughts. And I got a couple that said, you know, they're doing a really good job. So I've used the help ticket system once myself. So. Yes. Yeah. So, yep. so I guess I just, to, as a follow on, just the, the logistics of then to getting it onto YouTube, the town YouTube channel in a timely fashion, all of that is. Chase is really Chase and Annie are doing that. Right. They're doing a fantastic job. And so I think everything's out there now, Hannah. Do, do, are we doing good? I think so. Okay. <laughs> well, that settles it. Yeah. <laughs> Just kidding. But, uh, okay. Yeah. So Thanks. we do have that covered, and I think you know um, we'll still leave that line in there just um, for them to be able to come to meetings as needed. But I'll use my discretion on, and we're pretty good. To, we meet once a week and discuss. You know, do is there a need for you to come to a meeting or? Uh, or not. And I think Stephanie has been coming like for the first, you know, half an hour at, at their meetings and just making sure that you're set up that everything's working well and, and that's going very well. So I appreciate the question. And so this would be in place until you uh, develop a, or propose a long term contract, right? Right. So we've got another month roughly shy of a couple of days um and we'll work on just you know getting a longer term contract and it'll be very similar to what we have in the short term contract we'll just kind of update it and go through that and send it off to patrick and um have it notarized like we did before but it'll just be you know a longer term contract than the three months that we okay thanks um, um any of the outlying trustees have comments? Two or three of them out there. I'm really trying not to forget them. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I support moving through forward with Orion. Um, is that all we, you're asking, or are you asking us to change the whole uh, so, yeah, the processing system? So it's to approve action to allow staff to sole source a long-term contract with Orion Integrated Services, Inc. as provisioned in the town of Buena Vista, Colorado, purchasing policy in section 4A. Have that under your board action in the report. Does that answer your question, Mr. Rowe? Yeah, I think so. It's just, it's basically, it would still be determined whether the board would uh, allow that to happen. Yeah, correct? so it, yeah, it circumvents the uh, written process for us to need to go out for with an RFP or request for proposal and seek bids uh, because it is over. It will be over twenty five thousand. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Just as long as I feel like as long as things over twenty five thousand are still uh you know come before the board i think that's fine yeah absolutely yeah, this is just just a, a clarification i needed thanks mm -hmm. any other questions or comments um is there a motion to uh, approve the board action as suggested on page whatever it is one is 29 but it's the old agenda 107. 107, okay. I would like to make the motion to allow staff to sole source a long term contract with Orion Integrated Services Inc. as provisioned in the town of Buena Vista, Colorado, purchasing policy in section 4A. Thank you. Second. So Swisher Cobb. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes. Thank you very much. Y'all are doing 
Good work for us. Thank you for your patience during the uh, ramp up. Uh, <laughs> Thank you for your patience with me. <laughs> <laughs> and we are very thankful for the opportunity. Thank you. Glad to be here. Thank you. Doing a great job. Okay, we have reached the point of, board, of trustee interaction. And then we will have a short break um, so that we can um, move on to an executive session. So, um, Cindy, do you have anything you'd like to share? Um, I have a couple things. And one came out of the tree board, and it was the meeting that you weren't there, Sean, but they were talking about <laughs> on Main Street the ice melt that they use to get the ice off the sidewalks, the ice salt, that it kills the trees that are on Main Street, and that's one reason why they're replaced oh, frequently. Oh. But it was also mentioned that it goes into the stormwater drainage system and that it goes into the Arkansas River. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know this is a fact. That's why I'm looking at Sean while I'm saying it. And do we really want that going into our stormwater drainage? Does it harm what goes into the river? Would it be a lot easier just to tell people that they can't use that rock salt to help yeah. clear the yeah. sidewalk? Well, I think, I think you, yeah, and I appreciate the, you know, the, you know, the awareness and, 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 you know, in our environment, I mean, that's our, it's our role here. It's my, a lot of what I do is, um, is just that. What I can say is like, you know, almost every form of ice melt involves, you know, that component, you know, the, the highway, the stuff CDOT puts on, the stuff that, you know, we do some light sand mix with some salt in it in the winter times on our streets. It's not nearly as aggressive as what CDOT puts on the high, on the highway. And that ends up in the storm drain. Yeah, and it's, okay. it's and it's and it's an industry standard, and that's what we're talking about. I mean, these are all kind of industry standard kind of things. I think a lot of you know we, we can be thankful that like a lot of what what you know by the time it gets to the rivers and the creeks, it's somewhat like reduced because of the amount of moisture, and so. What the uh, you know what the salts do is they adjust the pH and things like that that you know aren't really ideal for you know our environment. Um, but you know, kind of one of the cool things is like you know, not it's not cool, but you know what the, one of the reasons why we want to you know work on our stormwater master plan is start creating you know detention you know and and retention areas and protecting that so stormwater basins that capture you know the water before you know is overflowed. There's, there's one in South Maine, there's a big one down there that kind of captures everything from the gutter and it puts it into a separator and, and during high water levels, it kind of peaks and comes out. And so there are there is some components there. I think what what we looked at um, last winter and the winter before was a different method. So we, we've been buying some wet um, ice milk. It's, it's in liquid form and it's, it's bio-friendly. And so okay. I think that's something that we could maybe talk about. Okay. Yeah. My other question is, I'm getting pretty excited to see the new police department. Is it supposed to be unfinished? It is. Um, a lot of it's done. I think there was a delay with the HVAC system. Yes, so that's it's correct. About another three to four weeks. Okay. So that's okay. We'll we'll survive. Yeah, and I'd like to chime in here because I'm um, trying to incorporate that into our goals retreat. And I'm looking at May 13th, uh, which is a Saturday. Um, and originally I had hoped that the HVAC would be in and we could do the whole meeting there in the conference room. But um, it sounds like we won't have our certificate of occupancy quite yet. But I do think that we can still start that with a tour uh, of the facility and then move to the airport uh, conference room to do our actual, um, our actual goals retreat. Uh, but I think it would be very inspiring for you to see a goal come to fruition. Um, it, it just provides sort of a sense of, of reality and purpose that you know these are the things that we're talking about. 
and, and they do happen. It, it does take some time, but they do eventually happen and that's the important part of it. So, so, uh, so I will send out a formal email. I haven't had a chance to sit down and do that yet. But that's what I'm looking for is May 13th. And it would be basically uh, from either eight or nine until like noon or one, somewhere in there. Um, and I'll look, get some feedback from you all, but that's what I'm looking at. That's, that's all I have. Okay. Um, Sue, anything? Nope, I think I took plenty of time okay. with my other earlier Peter? comments. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to mention that I went to the uh, workforce boot camp um, last week, so last Thursday. I don't know if you want to talk more about it, it kind of what we went over, but. Um, and if you'd like, it was a lot of information. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was interesting. I thought uh, there were some things I was going to um, yeah. point out, particularly kind of like the Salida BV kind of difference in the school districts and their um, different levels of engagement, engagement, particularly on the workforce learning. Um, so internships basically uh, program through, through CMC and we're slowly ramping up here in BV, but we're quite a bit behind and there's a few different reasons for that, but we're moving in the right direction, it sounds like. And, um, uh, but yeah, it sounds like a great program that they're doing in Salida right now. Um, and I was actually talking to somebody there about town. So I'm like, well, I'm you know, trust you, we wouldn't be involved in that. They're like, I don't know if there's some kid in high school who wants to major in poli sci or something in college, it could actually be really interesting internship to spend a semester kind of doing all the different elements of the town. But I was that kid in high school, so <laughs> yeah. it was really fun. <laughs> um, it was cool. I mean, one of the things I asked when I was there, because I thought it was an interesting experience was, you know, for these kids, you know, one of the things I hear a lot and I think we all talk about is, um, you know, we love living here, but there's no way our kids will ever be able to afford to live here, or there's no way that our kids can see a future for themselves here. And so, I, one of my thoughts is, you know, these internship programs and these, um, you know, are these kids able to then kind of see a pathway for themselves here? And so it sounds like it helps a little, it's not at all the answer to the bigger problem, but it kind of, like if I, one kid, I guess, was working with um, a landscape, landscaping company, and he was gonna work efforts, but then through the process, learned how to start his own landscaping company to then kind of, which that seemed to be the solution for everybody. So you won't find a job, but everybody realized you could be an entrepreneur and find your own job to pay for yourself. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, anyways, it was an interesting uh, uh, program. I appreciate you guys putting it on. Do you want me to do like a brief overview of what the event was for people? So it's boot camp, but the morning was focused on internships in the talent pipeline. So what we're doing in the area to create a workforce environment here and to bring or keep the talent that we have and really encourage them. And like he said, there was like three of the kids up there who had all started their own small businesses at that point. So, mm -hmm. um, but then the second half of the day was a lot about how employers can write better um, job descriptions was one of the things, be better employers and have good expectations for what their employees should expect from them and what they should have from them. So the first part was about the next generation. And then the second half day was about how can we be a good place to work? So, and they also, one of the things I really appreciate is the section on how to be more creative with incentivizing quality of work. So, it's not just about salaries and housing is always a big deal, but how can you, for example, partner with Monarch Ski so that people get free ski pass? And so, how can you kind of work as a community to find a way to help with talent within the community and, you know, mentorship programs and everything else to kind of help with that? It's nice. Mm. Um, let's see, tomorrow I'm going to speak to the Young at Heart group about what's going on in BV, just happenings and what we're, what we're spending our time on. Um, and then uh, on the 18th of April, Dean and I are going to be um, judges in a national <clears throat> civics B. Nice. Which should, <laughs> should be pretty cool. Um, so there are 20 kids, I think, all from BB, who, who have been studying civics. They're, they're middle school students, sixth, seventh, and eighth graders. And they'll answer multiple choice questions, which will get graded. And then 
um, if they, and they've each written a 500 word essay about things they think could be, be done in Buena Vista that would improve the town. Um, and then uh, the, the five students who make it um, through the multiple choice test will then uh, answer questions about their essays from the judges. And then, oh, and each kid got a, a tablet. And then the first place um, finisher will get $500. The second will get 250 and the third will get 150. And then those three go on to the state competition. Cool. So it's a really neat, you know, first year program sponsored by the League of Women Voters and others. And the chamber too, right? Chamber, yeah. 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 Just a question. Is it possible that we can get those essays in our packet? I mean, if it's about what could be improved in our town, <laughs> I don't know. or just somehow have them available. Yeah, because they're us. kind of interesting. Yeah. I just uh -huh. think it'd be. I'll, to, I'll ask Heather okay. um, whether that would be any kind of an invasion of their, oh, yeah. you know, their rules. Would be interesting if, if there's nothing, you know, as far as invasion of privacy or, I mean, they could probably say, yeah, we're open to it or no, we're not. I would say each kid can make that decision. Yeah, that's good. Good idea. It's nice to get those young ideas of what. Yeah, because I'm running out myself. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, that's it for uh, me. Anybody else on the staff have comments they want to make? The only thing I have is uh, when I talked with Jesse this morning, he he had asked me, um, how are the trustees feeling about their Chromebooks? Um, there's a limitation to the uh, the, the remote end capabilities that they can have to help you. Um, so with staff with full laptops, they're able to help us remotely if, oh. if need be. And with you not being really in office, it would be helpful, uh, you know, to do that. So he was just kind of batting around the idea of, you know, how are you feeling about your Chromebooks? Um, I don't know how old they are. I was going to talk to Philip and see if he knew. Not a couple years, old. maybe two years old. Two years old. I think old they. Even. I think they were new when I became a trustee last April. I think that everyone was kind of getting getting them. Yeah, they're, they're pretty. New. <laughs> Are you I just don't hold a charge. That's why I don't use it anymore. Okay. See, yeah, because you're you're using like your private laptop then, mm -hmm. or yeah. You know. And I usually use an iPad, but if I were remoting in, I could use either an iPad or just a laptop mm -hmm. and and that was the other thing he was concerned about was with the chromebooks how easy is it to zoom in it was another question and then also um with you now needing to look at powerpoints on your screens is that something that you can do on your chromebook easily so just questions because if it's if we need to budget for laptops instead it, it he didn't think it would be more than a couple hundred for each one, but it might be worth budgeting for that in 2024. And we just didn't know what your thoughts were on that. So if you could think about that and you could always email Jesse or Steph or the help desk and kind of your thoughts on that. I think that would be helpful. Uh, do any of our Zoomers, are they using theirs now? Yeah, I'd be interested to hear um, from the trustees online, how that how that goes for them with the Chromebooks. I'm I'd, using. Oh, go ahead, Devin. Oh, I'm using it. It's it's fine. It's louder than the other uh, flippy dudes that we used to have. I don't remember what they were. Oh. I just think it's annoying that I have to log in twice, but that's. I guess that's just me. <laughs> yeah, and I my understanding is that wouldn't be something you'd have to do with the laptop too. So for whatever reason, I think the Chromebook is unique for that. So okay. Gina. I just I've been using my Mac laptop, my personal for the entirety as it just seems to be better fit for me and compared to what the Chromebooks do and their capabilities and even the interface. So 
I prefer to continue, <clears throat> excuse me, using um, my MacBook for the time being, just my two cents. And if you had access to a laptop instead through town, would that be, you'd be willing to, to do that instead? Cause I kind of, I don't know. Is it going to be a Mac or is it a PC? Because <laughs> well, I'm a Mac person, not a PC person. So. <laughs> we could probably weigh in on that. Send them your thoughts. <laughs> is there a security concern with us using our personal laptops instead of the town laptops? Well, I wonder if there might be, um, because, you know, you if you have files or things and you're connecting to the server, it's your personal laptop that you're connecting to the server. And so... I almost feel like it, if, if you're not happy with the Chromebook and you're having to use your private resource and it could be a security thing, but also I just think it's just, we should be providing you <laughs> with the tools that you need to make the decisions that you have to make. And so, you know, that was one of the reasons I asked the question is because I want to make sure that we're not only secure, but that we're giving you guys the so thank you for your feedback out there. Yeah, I think it's not that hard to use these uh, Chromebooks. I don't know why. I think they're, they charge fine. And the only thing is if you close it when it's on, it will die. But that's the only thing that I've noticed. I use it all the time because okay. my laptop is uh, pretty old and was like $400 11 years ago so it's not doing that that good so this is my fancy computer so <laughs> okay well that's that's good and if you have anything else you can email stuff or just and just give your thoughts on that we're just trying to think next year and what we need to put in the budget and uh, so that's it okay um, we are going to have an executive session, and um, is there somebody who would like to make a motion to go into executive session? I can read you a little more about this. Um, I'll make a motion to go into executive session. The motion that I would like would be to um, move that the Board of Trustees enter into an executive session um, to hang on a second to hold a conference with the town's attorney to receive legal advice on specific legal questions pursuant to CRS section 26-4024B. Is with is someone willing to make that motion? This has to do with the Carbonet Street property. So moved. Second. Okay, so we have Hilton, Hanga, and Cobb. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, um, so uh, since we have uh, a quorum and um, a majority have voted to go into executive session. That is what we will do, and we will take a five-minute break. We'll begin again at nine fifteen. Mayor, just just quick comment. Just yes, to be a little technical. Just a little technical here. The law requires that you have a two-thirds majority vote, and I just want to make sure that we were clear that it was a unanimous vote to go in executive session. You just said majority, and I wanted to make sure that we're not on the record improperly. Okay, it was a unanimous vote of the six trustees. Thanks. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you for referring August. For what? Thank you for referring <laughs> August. Oh, did he, did he contact you? He contacted so me. I hired just, him. You he have. He has to get here. That's first. awesome. Oh, I'm <laughs> yeah. so glad. Yeah, he's, he's a Chris. wonderful kid. He's such How a bright kid. No okay. Way. Across the street from uh, his parents, Bob Tate, Stacey Tate, 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 Tate,
Yes, yeah, and they live here. That person we've known him since he was born. Oh yeah. Well, my office. Yes. About three blocks. Well, it is. It, oh really? Okay. Yeah. I yeah, was, yeah. I was yeah. right at 17th and yeah. Nine, and yeah. I'm a member of Lighthouse Writers Workshop that. 16th and Rice. Oh, oh okay. Uh, awesome. and Rice. Okay, just yeah. This was just in Park Hill so, and Kearney uh, and, uh, yeah, on Kearney yeah, Street. Uh, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I know. And uh, yeah. anyway, so they have a long history here mm -hmm. and his. Uh,